And this is something I think ancient and medieval thinkers got right, even as they were wrong about lots of other things. They were right that the merchants are self-serving people who don't know how to build a society, don't know how to build a state, and will destroy a state or a society if they're put in charge of it for any length of time. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see... We still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between so between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Benjamin, um, I know a little bit about your bio, but you're always doing new things. So how would you want to introduce yourself? It Oh, you know, I think it's fine to just say that I did a PhD in politics at Cambridge and I uh, write political theory, more or less. Okay. So, well, what are the podcasts that you're a part of? Now? Oh, yes. I do Political Theory 101 and I do The Lack. Those are my two podcasts. The Lack is okay. films and Political Theory 101 is, is uh, theorists. So no new podcasts. As of yet, no new podcasts as of yet. No, <laughs> okay, all right. So, you wrote, um, and you write all the time, you but you wrote a piece for the Platypus Affiliate Society Journal, the Platypus Review, called Beyond Bonapartism Breaking Statophobic Thought Taboos, which, um, I was triggered by just by the headline. I was triggered by that, but then I, I thought, well, wait a minute, I, I better read it, and I did. And there are many interesting arguments in the piece, um, but let me see if I can try to sum up the primary argument, which is that while during the bourgeois revolutions it made sense to imagine uh, that the society or civil society could overcome the state and rule itself um, in order to develop uh, everyone to their maximum ability and develop society to its highest uh, possibility. Um, today, we are f so thoroughly mediated by a state that has its tentacles in so many aspects of our lives and is divided against itself so thoroughly that that ambition is no longer feasible. Is that, am I summarizing your argument? Yeah, I would well? say that's fair. Okay. And so, um, Let's walk through it a little bit more slowly. Um, you you write about the Lord of the Rings as a as a, as a metaphor for for one of the difficulties that we're facing on the left. Yeah, this gotten... came from when I was teaching Tocqueville at Cambridge. Whenever we would do Ancient Regime and the Revolution, I always like to bring up the Lord of the Rings to try to give students an idea of how Tocqueville is picturing. The ancient regime. The ancient regime used to be a monarchy where you had mediating layers of nobles and priests, church, aristocracy. So if something goes wrong in a uh, you know, medieval French community, there's all these questions about who might be responsible for it. Why is there not enough food? Is it because of what the king is doing? Is it because of the duke or the baron or the bishop or the priest or who's doing it? And everybody can point their fingers at each other. And when there's a rebellion, the king can take the side of the nobles against the peasants or take the side of the peasants against the nobles. They're all able to play off discontents in different parts of the medieval society to strengthen one another in a struggle amongst themselves. And uh, the difficulty with this, of course, is that foreign states can choose sides in these internal conflicts and exploit them and use them to weaken kingdoms. So over the course of the Middle Ages, the way the French state responds to this is that it uh, gradually eats these layers of mediation. The king gets more and more and more power, becomes this absolutist monarch, you know, l'état c'est moi, I am the state, right? Mm -hmm. And 
as this happens, when you have a discontent, it becomes harder and harder to point at these mediating layers because those layers are weaker. And many of the most important and influential people in the church and in the aristocracy are crowding into Paris, crowding into Versailles, trying to get influence at court. So people really don't have any way of communicating or getting their problems up to the king. And insofar as they have problems, uh, there's no one really to blame but the king. So I like to talk about the Lord of the Rings. If you are in the Shire at the beginning of the Lord of the Rings, you're a hobbit in the Shire, you're in this beautiful place, and you know that there are realms of men and dwarves and elves and all sorts of beautiful forests and mountains and happy little places. And you got all this stuff to look at. There's all these different things going on, right? But when the hobbits come into Mordor and they just see the tower alone by itself and desolation surrounding it, they're just confronted by the tower, by the center of power and by the great eye in all of its repressiveness. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, they feel absolutely compelled to go and do what they need to do. At the start, Gandalf has to tell them, you have to do this. Very bad things will happen if you don't do it. But when they're in Mordor and they just look at the tower, it's very obvious what to do. So a, a French state that loses its layers of mediation, it becomes like Mordor. It becomes a state where it's very obvious that state power is the king, is the monarchy, and that's what you must confront. And today we are more like the hobbits in the uh, Shire, where we're surrounded by foliage, unable to see just where the power lies. But it seems like Beyond that, power isn't actually in that tower anymore either, right? The mediation is its own power. It, it, it actually is divided up and rearranged power. In right, because the mediation doesn't just change the way it looks. It also does distribute the power in the state in a way that makes the state more difficult to operate, right? The reason that the king needs to concentrate power around himself is that when he's sharing power too much with the nobles and the priests, it weakens him. It means that the English can come and, and take over his land. It means that he can't invade Italy or he can't invade Spain because he has to worry about internal problems. So you create these forms of mediation and they keep everybody confused and, and people, if not happy, then at least unable to act uh, in a way that's effective. But if you get, uh, if you, if you, introduce enough mediation, it does make it harder for the state to act, and it does introduce dysfunction and state capacity problems into the picture. And I think that's what a lot of us are missing. We, we talk all the time about how we can't get this united society, we can't get this bourgeois subject or, or other kinds of revolutionary subjects that we think existed or might have existed in the past. But there's a new possibility here, which is that the state is getting so bogged down by its mediation that it's becoming dysfunctional in a new and distinctive way. Yeah, okay, so it seems to me like if I go to the next section of your essay, which is called After Rousseau, you sort of uh, shift from this description of the state as a, uh, as when it's basically the description of how the state can camouflage its own roles and protect itself from mediation uh, into what we're discussing now, um, how the state uh, kind of turns against itself and becomes hypermediated even internally. Um, and, and tell me if I'm getting this wrong. It's when that happens that not only do you lose the ability to understand and resist or overturn power, but um, you start to lose your ability to understand the world or function um, well, you know, at least it, it starts to degrade, um, both within society or civil society and, and the state. Is that correct? Yeah, it degrades the subjects to be in this confusing situation. So it makes the subjects worse. And then at the same time, it requires more from the state actors. They have to be better and more elite kinds of subjects to deal with the confusion and make the state operate. So it mm -hmm. requires higher and higher levels of competency to make this state operate, while at the same time, the subjects are becoming less and less capable. And it's difficult for the elites to ensure that they remain capable when they are presiding over a system that is making most people most of the time less capable. And this is an opportunity because if the elites themselves become degraded as a, as a result of the mediation, if they drink too much of the mediation Kool-Aid, 
Mm-hmm. Then they also are degraded. And then nobody's running the state and it becomes something that uh, nobody's really in charge of. And at that point, you have a kind of runaway train problem. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it seems to me that, you know, I'm, I'll, we'll go back into the, the, your actual text, but it seems to me just to step out into this moment for a second that we have uh, in the United States uh, a system where we have the bureaucratic state, the administrative state filled with experts, which um, is mostly f- also filled with loyalists to one of the parties, the Democratic Party, I would say. That's how I perceive it but not exclusively so, and which is um, relatively a relatively stable institution of, of authority. And then you have the political class, which is trying to manage that, set rules for the bureaucratic state and, and uh, also mediate between the, that state and society. Is that a good description of this, the United States, you think, at the moment? I, I think we could add a lot of additional layers of mediation to that. The, the difficulty mm-hmm. is to explain all of the mediation would take much more time than we have, and we would start disagreeing with each other and people in the audience if we tried to do it. But you don't disagree with that kind of sketch of the, our situation? I, I just I want to emphasize that part of what's making this so difficult is that to try to give an account of what our state is at this time is itself an almost impossible task. Okay. Okay. All right. I fair enough. So it is sprawling. It is mm-hmm. nearly infinitely divided. Um, right. I mean, like for one, we we could talk about the state governments, or we could talk about you know the branches of government, or we could talk about the local governments, or we could talk about the TNCs, the the corporations, the tech companies, and their relationships with the state, or the defense contractors, and and we could go on and on and on about this, and we could argue with each other about which of these parts are more important or less important. And this would all be examples of the confusion, right? And people in the audience, even if you and I agreed, there would be people in the audience who would disagree about the way we'd characterize all of it. Right. That's true. I would say that what I was trying to lead up to was the idea that this uh, administrative state in all of its various parts has um, extended itself into civil society in ways that obscure its existence and role um so it, you know the administrative state uses uh funding federal funding to set up ngos and and other and nonprofits and uh and foundations in collusion with private money power oligarchs to uh administer society Um, But often different parts of the state are engaged in forming or supporting different activities in society that conflict with one another, right? And these different billionaires and and companies are supporting things that are in conflict with each other. So uh, to try to resist a kind of almost Althusserian drift into there's a state and the state is got its tentacles in society or a kind of Habermasian colonization of the life world where it's the state that's gone into society that retains a unitary character for the state and for the society that I'm trying to problematize. Right. Well, I'm trying to push against you problematizing that a little bit because I see in this particular moment uh, a an attempt by that aspect of the state to um, colonize, control, um, dominate mediation itself, meaning the media primarily, but but also speech down to a local, you know, individual level. I was thinking about um, Justin Trudeau's recent introduction of uh, the Online Harms Act, which is. I think of as a piece in a puzzle where the federal states around the world are cooperating um, to create a new form of government or governance, which will be much more directly, uh, uh, well, which will overturn the old rights-based um, approach to government and try to integrate the whole of society into the, into the state. So that's why I I am I had that triggered response to your like you know get you know get over your your state of phobia it was because I feel like in this moment we're actually facing an attempt to fully integrate civil society into the state um, on a, at least yeah. in the West. 
Yeah, you have a more Altasarian reading of this than I do. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Say a little bit more. What, what, how, how, how so? Well, I think that uh, my view is marked by what I am increasingly calling deep pluralism, that we have reached a point where there are disagreements in every part of the state and in every part of the society that go all the way down into categories that we previously thought of as, as consensus categories or safe from disagreement. Mm -hmm. And that what we're really seeing, uh, instead of, say, a unitary state that's trying to take over society, is uh, a proliferation of disagreements and conflicts that no one can manage or get on top of for any length of time. And so we're seeing lots of different people try to reconstruct consensus, initially with dialogue and persuasion, but as they realize that none of that works anymore because everybody disagrees about all sorts of basic things, by trying to organize whatever parts of the state or the parts of society are within their reach to try to consolidate power bases within it. Uh, but because there's so much division, it's not ultimately possible for anybody to succeed in straightforwardly imposing a consensus. We're not headed back to something like, you know, the 80s or the 50s or the 90s, you know, where there was this monoculture and this, uh, you know, society that was in some way structured by the state or by the state in combination with some set of uh, civil society organizations that perhaps were still meaningfully independent from the state. I think we have a much, much more agonistic mm -hmm. system at this point. Hmm. Well, I wanna be dialectical about this. I wanna grant you what you're saying is true because it is on one level, obviously true. And I'll give you an example, maybe a silly one that occurred to me recently, which was that, I, well, I, I went to the movie, uh, The Fall Guy. I'm one of the few who did. I get, didn't do that well in the box office. but um, And I was surprised that the movie had been made because I remembered the original television show. It had been a mediocrity and not particularly well-loved at the time in my from my memory. Um, that, you know, of the things that the, the star of that show did, Lee Majors, it was definitely the, you know, half forgotten uh, also ran category. It was, he was known for the six million dollar man that make a movie of that. Sure. The fall guy, I didn't it just it didn't make sense to me that, that it had been made. But then I realized, oh, but that show is from a period of time where even a complete mediocrity would be more well known, even a truly cheap and forgettable bit of entertainment and video could be really well known amongst millions of people just because the, there were three or four networks and there was one mass culture and he happened to get lucky enough to be you know, at the center of it on a certain night at a certain time for a few years. And so that was enough to justify a, a multi-million dollar or, you know, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't know how much they spend on movies anymore, but to be spent on creating this product, um, it was a, considered a good risk. But then I thought, well, in the future, 20, 30 years from now, how will Hollywood have any intellectual property to make a safe bet on? Like, what? where will there be a mass audience anymore? Everything is so fragmented. And um, the first time yeah. I had this, I, go ahead, I'll let you respond to all that. Oh, just uh, we're seeing this with the current negotiations between the NBA and TNT and NBC, because as uh, television viewership numbers decline and people get their media from a wider variety of different places, sports leagues are one of the few ways you can still draw mass audiences but even those audiences are smaller than they used to be for all of the major sports mm -hmm. and so a consequence of this is that even though the nba draws fewer viewers than it did 10 years ago on television it's more valuable to these networks because relative to anything else that they can put on tv the value of of a sports league is just enormous and this is resulting in a, a crazy bidding war I think if, if we have had any kind of achievement as the millennial digital computer people, it's that we broke the monoculture in a way that uh, seems to me to be irreversible at this point. Yeah, I mean, right. I would, as a Gen Xer, and just to be a contrarian, I would say it was, in fact, the boomers and the technology that they created 
that through the 90s and the vision of the cyberpunks and also the old counterculture of the 60s in, end up conquering and breaking the monoculture. There was a guy named um, uh, Are You Serious? He was a science fiction writer, and he ran a, a magazine called Mondo 2000 back in the 90s, and it was a cyberpunk culture magazine. And a few years ago, right before I got let go from Zero Books, he had written a book we were going to publish, and it was about, amongst other things, how the cyberpunks won, and in losing, they lost. They had defeated conformity in the mass culture, and then at the same time become the establishment and you know created a dystopian version of of what their dream had been so like in back in the 90s you would see on the cover of mondo 2000 like a big headline cyber sex is it coming and now it's like oh my god cyber sex could there be anything more alienating and awful uh, to imagine <laughs> than that but um so yeah so the uh the we are fragmented and yet we're fragmented through big tech, through actually pretty monolithic parts of society, pretty concentrated and powerful entities that uh, kind of oversee our fragmentation. So yeah. how do you, what do you make of that? Yeah, and there has been this attempt to try to prevent these things from being effective mechanisms for disseminating new political perspectives throughout society. And I think that's been successful. It's no longer possible for us to imagine that we're going to unite society behind something like a Bernie Sanders through posting on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok. At the same time, it is also the case that they have not been able to use social media to bring everybody back around to Joe Biden or to the neoliberal consensus or to uh, some kind of centrist politics. So we can't use it to displace them, but they also can't use it to restore the kind of confidence in the establishment that used to exist. Can Trump use it? Can the right, can the populist right-wingers and reactionaries use it more effectively? No, I mean, they, they disagree with each other too. They have all sorts of internal conflicts. And as soon as Trump is gone, all of that will come out. Right, thing, right now, the only thing they agree on is that they're for him. Underneath yeah. that, there's this sharp, sharp conflict between the religious people who are increasingly critical of markets and the uh, libertarian people, and they're just not going to be able to get along long term. Right, right. So, OK, so you're saying that there's a that in the contest between centralization and atomization, atomization is is as one. Um, and that this is a crisis not just for revolutionaries and radicals who want to change the state, but for the state itself. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. The, the modern state, for it to operate, requires a level of consensus or a level of centralization that it no longer enjoys. And so it increasingly is sick. Mm. Okay. So it... Even though the capital and the financial side of the state and the and the power of the military is still as concentrated as ever, you're talking about an ideological concentration which we no longer that the state no longer has. Is, right. Is that Everybody right? is in their own internet, right? Everybody's phone, everybody's computer gives you your own little version of the world. And increasingly, those atomized versions of the world are very, very different from each other to the point where we can't even talk about subculture or scene anymore. That Even that implies a level of unity to these uh, experiences that no longer exist. Right. That's true. And I've thought for a long while, probably over a decade, that there no longer is a counterculture, a possibility for a counterculture. Um, someone said on the... Uh, one of my feeds the other day is that, oh, the difference between Gen X and Zoomers is that Gen X uh, were interested in alternative culture, as if there could be such a thing as an alter, like an alternative to what exactly? Yeah. One way of putting it would be, you know, back in the, in the 50s, people wanted to be normal. And maybe in the 80s and 90s, people wanted to be cool. And now there's no agreement on what cool is. Right, right. But everything is cringe. Yeah, everything is cringe from most <laughs> points of view. Everything that anybody likes is repellent and disgusting to most people. <laughs> oh my god. 
that's that's a very useful thing for me to think. But I think that's true. If you go on Twitter, um, it certainly seems to be that way. Uh, you can't be honest without being disgusting to most people at this point. Right. And even if you're dishonest, you're, you're not sure you're going to be dishonest the right way. <laughs> right. right. So you can't even manipulate people effectively anymore, because what would you say? And this is the problem Kamala Harris experienced when she ran. Depending on which room she was in, she said different things to different people. And the problem is, you know, you can get away with that when you run for senator or governor of a state. But when you run for president, eventually people hear what you said in the other rooms. And at this <laughs> point, politicians who say different things to different people are caught. And all of the Clinton era politicians who learned from the Clintons how to do mm -hmm. that, none of them can actually become popular in the country anymore. And they don't understand it. They're all confused about it. Right. But Trump manages to be able to say different things to different people uh, and get away with it all the time. But yes, but it's not a blueprint that everybody else can follow. And it's something that only works for a, a chunk of the population. The Trumper part of the population is still a minority of the overall population in the country. Right. But they're enough of a... a block that they can possibly put him into the White House again. Right. But you can win an election at this point without being liked by very many people at all. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. OK. All right. So to get back to the Marxism thing, um, the vision like I talked to I went to New York a, a few weeks ago and I talked to Sean KB, who's a, from the Antifada podcast. Do you know him? Have you heard of that podcast? And uh, yeah, I've I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, he's on um, Substack, uh, and he and he, he came out of anyway. He's he's a another podcaster in the space, and and he's a nice guy. Um, and he was talking about how he what he wants to do is rebuild civil society to start on the level of trying to get people to connect in real life and have uh, civil society institutions that would be left or socialist. Um, it's all part of dreaming of returning to uh, the 19th century and the idea of international socialist party. Um, I like it because I'm nostalgic for a time I was, of course, not alive, but also because uh, I am so dead set against the Althusserian, you know, centralized, authoritative, administrative state and the Democrats that the idea of breaking away and going to the, to the realm of civil society and building something there in a unified way appeals to me um and i guess that there's something ludite about it too because you'd have to kind of walk away from your screens and all the ways in which we're mediated in order to try to to build in on that level um what do you think about the prospects for something like that to try to unify civil society at the level of civil society is that well, i mean i may have pointed out a problem but you you tell me what you think so a couple of I have a couple of issues with this. For one, I, I think it's an important position. I think this is a position a lot of smart people on the left have or are moving toward. So I think it's mm -hmm. important and worth addressing. Mm -hmm. I want to say first, many of the biggest problems that we had with the left in the tens came from the fact that the left was concentrated in cities and in universities and in places where there's a large enough concentration of us that we can gather in person at things like DSA meetings. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily wonderful for our ability to talk to the public at large for us to talk to each other a lot <laughs> it's maybe good for us we enjoy it it helps us think it can develop our thinking but it also can have this bubble effect that can alienate us and estrange us from most people but i think second and more fundamentally if everything is divided up to the degree that it is it just won't be possible for organizations to aim at becoming mass organizations and actually get anywhere by doing that. So if we are, I do think it's valuable to develop some civil society organizations because we need places from which to think and to work and to talk. And, and we've noticed mm -hmm. that our internet digital model is not working very well for us. And also the university system is not working very well for us. So I do think we need new organizations and new institutions. But I think a lot mm -hmm. of the people who are pushing this right now are thinking about it in terms of let's replicate the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the possibility of a united society in the way that 19th century people did. 
So our organizations will not become mass organizations. That doesn't mean that they're useless or that they can't perform functions or roles, but I think we should be clear-eyed about what it is that a civil society organization can do today. It can erect a perch in the declining society. It mm -hmm. can erect a perch from which it might be possible to see stuff and talk to stuff with the other birds that are on their perches. Mm -hmm. And we might be able to see things by doing this that might allow us to, to understand what's going on, grasp the situation and act in it effectively. But there are only a few of these perches around and it's not possible to make them everywhere. There are only so many of us who have wings to fly and will be able to find a place to land. Most people are not going to be able to get onto these perches in the kind of society that we have now. Uh, and I think we have to be aware of that. Now, why is that? What is it about now? When, when I, when I think about returning to civil society, one of the things I'm thinking is we don't have to start by being philosophers or particularly super political, but we could try to organize like bowling leagues and, just sort of speak to the uh, need that people have after the pandemic, particularly to meet in public and to be in real life together. Um, and that, uh, you know, that, and that if we did that in a way that was sort of aimed at working class people, in other words, for meeting with people who have issues on the job as part of it, then maybe we could, bring more people in to this party. Am I just being... I'm well, being... there's a reason the bowling leagues are gone, right? <laughs> you know, like that Bowling Alone book by Putnam, the study yeah. of the decline of those organizations, right? right? There's a reason that all of that stuff is gone. You know, for one, for most people, by the time they get home from work, they're too tired to go out and talk to more people. They want to get on the computer or they want to get in front of the TV or they want to get on their phone. That's what has been the trend line for the last 50, 60, 70 years. Now, if you ask people, people don't want to admit this because it's still uncool to admit that you're a digital subject. You know, people mm -hmm. will say, oh, yeah, I want to meet in person. But then people try to start stuff in person and only very small numbers of people are actually assembled. When, uh, when you think in terms of how many people are out there and how many people we would need to do anything, you get very small numbers of people. That doesn't make it useless. I think it's very valuable. I'd love going to stuff in person and I'd like to do it where I'm in Indiana so I don't get to do it that much. But sometimes I go up to Chicago for stuff and, and it's mm -hmm. great. And you know, when I was at Cambridge, sometimes I'd go out to stuff in London. And it, it's wonderful to do. And if you can do it, if you have the patience for it, the thing is a lot of us don't have the patience for it. A lot of us have become what I call uh, social unsociability instead of unsocial sociability. We mm -hmm. want recognition and we want people to pay attention to us, but we don't actually like people and we have very limited tolerance for disagreement and for <laughs> people who say things that rub us the wrong way or offend us. And so our ability to be in organizations together is really declined. And I think it's, it's something that those of us who resisted joining the DSA can easily go, say, oh, yeah, it would be great if we all met in person. But there's a reason that we all didn't join the DSA or if we did join the <laughs> DSA, most of us quit. And it's that actually we as digital subjects in this deeply pluralistic society where we disagree with each other about almost everything, when we get into a space with each other, we start disagreeing very quickly and those disagreements escalate. And the more we get to know each other and the more comfortable we become with each other, the more we reveal how much we disagree. And oftentimes, instead of allowing us to come together and act, it just makes us hate each other and, and it makes us emotionally exhausted. Uh, not always. I think if we, you know, we meet occasionally and we're careful about how much we do it and we meet with small groups of people and we're selective about who we include. And you, know, you, can, you can have meetings with people that are generative and helpful and wonderful. But I do think that when people start to think that they're going to reconstruct the 19th century associationism, that mm. that's where it starts to get really utopian. And then the way is shut part of me comes out and I start getting real despairy. <laughs> all right okay okay um no no I, okay well i want to i'm you're really making sense to me this is what's troubling to me about this is why i got so triggered and then you you make you're making sense to me now and it is something that i worried about because i mean listen i made a video not so long ago where i said 
this idea that we can combat uh, the spectacle by overcoming the problems that were presented in bowling alone is obviously wrong, right? You know, like we, we, we're not going to just be able to will our way back. Uh, I said something very much like this. And now suddenly I'm telling you, what about we could make bowling leagues? I don't know what's wrong with me, but, but, um, but I do feel, but I want to, I want to press on this idea though, that the more you meet people in person, the more comfortable you get with them, the more you reveal the truth, the true depth of your disagreement and the more likely there is to be, um, true animosity that gets built out of that <laughs> you know the the cliche is absence makes a heart grow fonder wait no that's not what i'm supposed to say um something opposite of that the reverse of that where the more intimate you are with someone the more care you have for them and the more uh, patient you are with them for the disagreements the more committed you are to someone the the more uh you know you'll be able to work through disagreements and come to some sensible arrangement in in between it, it, what about that idea? The reasoning together, disagreeing See, this in is, order. The, uh, what? <laughs> this is why I like to. This is why I like to say we have a 21st century digital subject that doesn't work like previous subjects. It doesn't work like the subject that we think of in in the 19th century. We've been degraded by the market. The market has spread throughout society, and mm -hmm. it has degraded us as subjects and made us different. We are not capable of doing a lot of the kinds of things we used to be capable of doing, and. There are some new things that we can do. There are some new things that we're good at in terms of using the computer. Uh, but there's a lot of things that people value politically that we're no longer able to do. And this matters for how we organize people and how we do politics. And I think that the really underappreciated aspect of all of this is the effect that the market has on subjects and the degree to which market society makes the individual or the bourgeois subject uh, impossible just impossible. It, it makes it impossible to produce at scale the kind of subject that can be uh, cooperative or collaborative in that kind of way. And that's why our society is getting so administrative. It's because we are not able to spontaneously get along with people that we have so many bureaucratic rules governing what we do and so mm -hmm. much threats of, of cancellation or threats of coercion or violence all the time and people turning to the state to protect them from everybody else because they view everybody else as crazy. Okay. Um, and for some good reason, we are all kind of getting nuts because the market yeah. is making us nuts. Well, I'm not sure about this idea that it's the market alone or the market because, well, here's what comes to mind for me. And I know this is like, I'm going back before what's happening now, but Horkheimer, after World War II, wrote that, in fact, the age of entrepreneurial capitalism and true free, truer free market capitalism was an age where, despite all of the limitations involved with making exchange value be the only value in society, nonetheless, people were led to think independently and therefore more thoroughly and in a more reasoning and rational way and to take in uh, some vision beyond themselves because they had to predict what would happen in the future a bit in order to remain in business and so forth. And the idea was in the Fordist period, the instead of that kind of cowboy, maverick, entrepreneurial, reasoning subject, bourgeois subject, you had instead... Um, uh, the herd mentality of the conformist and the the person who went along to get along and who only learned what he needed to say in order to make his bosses happy, not necessarily to get anything accomplished. And I feel like we're still in that phase um, and that to blame the market misunderstands both neoliberalism and um, the old Fordist welfare state. But well, what brought well, us to the Fordist welfare state? What brought us to the Fordist welfare state was the failure of the 19th century project. Right. That's true. But I would then that's when I stopped talking about reason and ideology and all that and just say, well, because of the economic, the value, you know, declining rate of profit, value system, labor theory about we didn't quite overcome the value form, the commodity form in the 19th century, but we got close. 
Well, and, and this is that what happens. People start saying there was some moment in the 19th century or maybe as late as 1917, 1922, 25, where it could have worked out. And then somebody did the wrong thing. Somebody made a mistake. Somebody took the wrong train or what have you. And, and uh, everything went different. But no, no, I think it's more fundamental than this. I think always from the start, that liberal notion of how we were going to create subjects that were capable of sustaining this kind of state and this kind of society, it was always a little bit utopian. There was yeah. always already a tendency for the market to produce competitive, uh, atomizing dynamics. And I think we see this in, say, Max Weber's discussion of the immaturity of the bourgeoisie, the inability mm -hmm. of the junkers to put aside their private interests and focus on their class interest or the interest of, of the state, and that this was causing a crisis and leading right. to a period where you would need charismatic leaders to unite society for the purpose of protecting it from all of this agonistic trade. Or there's the, you know, the Michael Pettis book that came out recently, a few mm -hmm. years ago, actually now, uh, Trade Wars Are Class Wars. About yeah, I read it. How the, yeah. yeah, that book. I think it does a wonderful job of showing how you begin with trade and markets and all of these liberal and libertarian ideals of the kind of society it will give rise to. But actually, ultimately, it produces a set of subjects that are defensive, that are looking at other people as, as competitors and as threats to them and are trying mm -hmm. to organize to overcome their competitors and to overcome those threats. And when we're all in the ego and we're atomized that way, we're not actually able to realize the capacities as subjects that this theory is, is trying to point us toward. And I, I value these capacities and I think we should try to generate them, but I think we need to recognize that the civil society organizations of the 19th century failed to generate those capacities. They failed to overcome the market. The market is what won. The market puts us in competitive agony with each other all the time makes us view one another as potential threats. It makes us view one another as, as other, and it degrades our ability to relate to people over time. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both. <laughs>